This is the OGM weekly call on Thursday, March 10th, 2022. Uh, today is a topic call and I'll uh, bring up the topic in just a sec, but we were talking about some emails I was reading recently. Um, well, one of the things that this fellow uh, wrote was that uh, American policy sort of rolled out and foisted on the rest of the world through organizations like WTO has been bad for other countries. And he contrasted here subsidies for agriculture in America, which are legal under WTO, and India's attempts to create markets for poor people's merch, which is what the Indian protests have been about recently, which are illegal under WTO, apparently. And um, I don't know the details behind it, but he was saying that that the particular things that America wants and America usually gets are often often create really terrible pressures for other countries and other places, and that that just sort of happens. So there's stuff like that. Yep. Well, there's also stuff like in the '90s, um, people as radical as Secretary of Defense Bill Perry and George Kennan, who was the architect of the containment policy strongly advised the Clinton government not to push NATO eastward. Right. Uh, and Perry apparently almost resigned over it. Uh, and one of, the, one of the pieces in the note I was reading said that James Baker III proposed to Gorbachev that they create sort of a, a frozen zone between, a buffer zone in the former Soviet states that wouldn't be NATO, but would be something else between. And he's like, you know, would this have, would this have played out differently if that had happened? And that's a really, very interesting question. Um, cool. Nice to see everybody. Uh, thanks for joining. Our, um, the question that came up, uh, uh, Grace and John replied on the Mattermost channel, and Grace started with something that I'm paraphrasing as how do we calibrate what we hear, um, which I think is a, a nice starting point maybe for our conversation today. And we can take it lots of different places. Uh, but a piece of this is a piece of this is about crap detection a la Pierre Gaggi and Howard Rheingold. A piece of this is about fact checking and so forth. But then another piece of this is about how voices show up in public conversation, mm -hmm. uh, how we deal with private conversation that's difficult, all those kinds of things. So I figured I'd open the floor uh, with those kinds of things and see where if anybody wants to jump in. Is Grace going to be with us? I think so. I'm hoping I'm waiting for her to show up. Uh, Mike, please jump in. Uh, I'm, I'm going to apologize. I have to drop off in about a half an hour and I'll try to get back on, but this is a great topic. Um, my colleagues at Carnegie spend a lot of time on influence operations. They've decided not to call it propaganda or disinformation because it, it really is more than that. And you mentioned the problem of correcting the facts then there's correcting the interpretation, and then there's changing the emotional impact. Mm -hmm. And we never talk about that very, it was just, we always focus on, let's get the facts right and then people will understand, or I'll give them a different a way to analyze the facts. But the, but the truth is that a lot of the influence comes from installing a certain emotional response into people. And sometimes that comes from the fact that I'm part of your tribe and I'm really mad about this. And because I'm really mad about it and you're part of my tribe, you should be really mad about it. And that bypasses the fa facts. Analysis has very little to do with that. But I think that's the part that we've not done enough work on. And the, the Ukrainians are doing an incredible job of using emotions to make an impact. And to, I mean, they've got a billion people on their side now. And some of it isn't because of the facts or the history or what is being said, it's because of the, the, fa the empathy factor. People are listening to the president, they're listening to the random person in the street and they're putting themselves in that position and thinking, God, that's just terrible. And so anyway, that's, that's another piece of this and I hope we'll spend some time on it. Thanks, Mike. And a, a piece of what I was reading this morning was a, a, a apparently conventional wisdom from foreign affairs that nations have interests, not principles. 
Mm -hmm. and that when they do something big, they're usually acting on their interests. But then when they explain it to their people, they have to pretend that it was based on principles. So they invent a narrative that they tell their people about this is the principle of why we're acting and what's going on. So, so these, these narratives and counter narratives then sort of do battle in, in the public sphere. But, but if you pay attention to sort of interests that you can often detect where things are coming from. That's an interesting way of looking at it. Uh, Grace, thanks for being on the call. I picked up your topic from Mattermost and have made, how do we calibrate what we hear, a paraphrase of your, of your question, the starting point for our conversation. So glad you're, glad you're in with us. Hope that's a reasonable paraphrase. Uh, and over to Gil. You are muted. Sorry, just trying to be polite and be muted. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Thank Mike, you thanks for, for what you said. It strikes me that we, that we, all of us live in an interpretation that human beings are fundamentally rational creatures. And we act, and we act in all kinds of ways. Yeah, I know, but we act in all kinds of ways if, as if that's true, even here among us. Um, well, and, because we know uh, that we're all rational, right? Yeah, except for the other guys. And, you know, and so the principles and interest distinction, I think, is really key. Uh, the interest question, of course, takes you to whose interests, because a country is not a unified collection of interests. Um, I, I was really struck by something I got from, uh, from Fernando Flores a couple of years ago. He, in, in response to this question, he said, no, we're, we're fundamentally emotional beings, but biological beings, number one, with nervous systems and biochemistry that react to things. Uh, and we're emotional beings, which is a layer on top of that. And we're historical beings, you know, formed by like, not just the tribe, but the history, my family and my parents' parents and where they come from and the stories that have been passed down and the cultural artifacts of all that, that are there before, all of that stuff is there before I do anything like what we call thinking. And thinking is this kind of other layer on it. We focus so much of our attention there, but we're these, we're these crazy old critters in this soup of, you know, of, 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 of hormones and neurotransmitters and stories. Um, and this external layer, Jerry, is I think you named it really well, that there's this story of principles and this reality of interest, but also there's interpretations of the interest. Like, you know, um, Zelensky is outraged that we're not doing a no-fly zone. Um, it's in his interest that we would do a no-fly zone. I mean, they, you know, change the dynamics of the war. We're in this story of, Holy shit, if we do that, will Vlad push the button? And I don't know the answer to that question. Probably nobody does. So there's this elaborate calculation on top of layers of intelligence, on top of pressure from all sides. Um, if, you ever, if you ever had the thought that you would never want to be president of the United States, this is a good time to have that thought. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, I, I don't envy the, the, the job to anybody these days, especially in sort of modern warfare and whatever else is going on. Um, I'm going to go slightly meta on the conversation for a second and then pass it to John, um, which is let's make room in this conversation for unconventional perspectives on what we're thinking or talking about. Let's, um, which is a sort of slightly ironic because this is about how we hear what we hear. So let's, let's pay attention to how we hear what we hear and let's just, let's sort of stand aside and look at it uh, rather than react to it so we can make a little bit more space uh, in the conversation as we go. John. Okay, so uh, yes to uh, a lot of what I've heard. I had to step away just for 90 seconds. Uh, definitely, it, it's, it's, it's considerably worse if you, it, 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 better or worse, but mostly worse, that it, we're not only not rational creatures, but if we tried to be if we tried to do the full fact checking, we would be overwhelmed. So what we're really looking for, we're not, we're not, you know, it's, it's not, um, you can't handle the truth. It is, you can't handle the truth. <laughs> it's because there's too much I, of it. I knew this would all come back to what's that. What's the name of the movie? <laughs> yeah. uh, a few good men. A few whatever. good men. Thank you. Um, so what, some, someone had a, a comment in, online the other day. They said, it, it might've been an OGM, OGM person in a non-OGM context. I somehow had that recollection um, saying, well, uh, Putin is a war criminal. Well, what about that as a statement? And I immediately go, eh, 
and my 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 react my negative reaction is not that it's not true or it's not or, or that I you know it's my, my my reaction is that's not a powerful metaphor, that's not a powerful fact squeezer, because we all got to have fact squeezers and we want ones that are rich. Now that they have they have to be both intellectually rich and emotionally rich, to sustain our energy as we navigate this very difficult area of sense making. So I'll give you one example. Um, there is a an article on Medium. I don't know who's seen it. It's by Jessica Wildfire, who doesn't usually write in this kind of space. I was really surprised. And she says, Putin has already won. And what she lays out is a model. It's, it's a model of, it's a little bit like the mafia model. She says, what's he doing? Well, he's doing, you know, what a godfather would do. Why do you, why do you uh, excessively and dramatically overkill uh, a client, <laughs> you know, because you're trying to communicate to the other clients what's going to happen to them. Uh, why do you focus on the nuclear power plants? Well, because you want to, you know, you want to communicate this extra layer of, you know, I'm a lot. I might be crazy. I'm I'm a lot more dangerous than you think. Um, so you know, don't even think about uh, resisting. If it comes when your turn comes up, you know, your turn might not be coming up now, but just I'm work. I'm doing the long game here. Oh, yes. And you're 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 going to hurt my economy and you're going to hurt the Russian citizens and blah, 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 you know, and I'll paste over that with. Uh, you know, patriotic garbage, and it doesn't matter whether it works or not. I mean, the, 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 the interesting thing I didn't like, I, I like the article because it forced me to rethink my model. I, damn, what, what, you know, <laughs> it's like, wow, you know, and it, and, it, and it said that a lot of these things that we might have thought were worthy efforts, either tactically or in the fact finding sense, that they wouldn't matter if you accept this model, which is the mafia model, you know, he, he's, he's basically a, a gangster, he's basically showing you what's what's in store for you if you get in his way. So my whole point is that is the that sense making. Not that it's right. It's not that it's right. It's that it forces you to rethink and reorganize all the all the incomplete facts that you're carrying. And so if I'm going to go forth and try to make sense, I want a bunch of those. I want a bunch of very powerful, very disturbing in a way, very emotionally, you know, stories about what he might be doing, uh, what's what strategy, you know, what's Zelensky doing, what's the strategy, what's our strategy, da 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 da. And I probably need a couple of those, and I and I have to not like some of them <laughs> quite a bit, or else I'm not really doing my job in terms of forcing my brain to juggle its mental models. So that's um, it for now. Thanks, John. That, that's, um, I love that. And you reminded me of a piece I read recently by Umayyar Haik, uh, who is usually pretty out there. And in this case says, hey, um, Putin is doing this to show everybody he can beat anybody up and destroy them. It's, it, this is basically a thug on the street warning everybody and plays that logic out. And, and entertaining these different logics is really important. And a piece of framing of how politicians and spinmeisters frame is to make sure you don't look at alternate framings. A, 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 ta a tactic they employ is to guarantee that you don't pay attention to other ways of seeing something. And, and yet both sidesism isn't helping civilization move forward, right? So, so how do we find a middle ground between these things? Uh, Doug then Gill. Okay, I think that what's on my mind is our illusion that we, our language is adequate to the times that we live in. There is that problem too. But language is such a thin structure on top of reality. It maps in, but not very much. So we're left, well, uh, since I'm also a painter, I look at the world in a painterly way at times, and it's a totally different world than the world I see in language. I mean, if you just look at the room around you, the incredible amount of detail that's there, that language just doesn't touch. Uh, so I think that uh, we, 
in our education, we generally learn that the way the world looks in one language might be different than the way it looks in another language. But we're not taught very much about how language in general is a very weak uh, map of reality that we have to live in. And that's why emotions play such a big role, because it ties together the facts in the language world with some connection down into stuff that's more real. Uh, but it's not terrific. So anyway, that's my thought this morning. Thanks, Doug. And, and then there are, there are eras or periods where certain words in a language be, develop deeper resonance, whether it's they change in historic context or meaning. Uh, so right now, freedom is a, is a word that's very different from what freedom maybe meant 100 years ago. Um, and it's, it's sort of uh, a little laden right in the in, in the public sphere uh but th th that happens all the time and language is pretty weak um gil grace mike yeah um echoes to what john said i mean th th this is a time of huge importance of exposing ourselves to different sources and different perspectives including the ones that we really don't like um uh, so there's that um it, I mean, it it, it, it seems to me that we're, we have this real problem, like human beings are not very well set up for handling complex information. Um, we're not set up for contradictory, uh, multi, you know, uh, uh, we want logic, we want binary choices, things are not, things are messier than that. We're, I, I'm going to keep going, Jerry. <laughs> your, no, 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 that's fine. The whole your, finger, of, your fingers don't scare me. <laughs> the, the whole intention of hand signals is to not interrupt you, which I'm doing now, but th this is meant to be like, I'm not so I sure know. about that. I know, I know, it's okay. Yeah. Um, 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 uh, we like clean binary choices. We don't like messy decisions. We don't like multivariate logic. We don't like, in, you know, choosing between really bad choices. Uh, and the mediators layer on top of that and give us black and white views of a very, very messy world. We, Ken, the we is all of us and the we is the mediators both. I mean, we the nature of humans and we the way the modern media society works. Uh, and back to the, to the bully question. I mean, I, I think about this one a lot, you know, what, how do you deal with bullies? Uh, you know, you yield, you back away, you yield, at some point you take the bully down. The threat of taking this bully down is that he's threatening he'll blow up the whole game board. Um, and I, I posted the link to that wonderful scene in The Untouchables where uh, Sean Connery, the seasoned cop, is advising uh, Kevin Costner, the, you know, the, the, the straight up good guy FBI agent, about how you deal with the mob in Chicago. Uh, it's, it, it has an emotional appeal. It's like, you know, take the bully down on his own terms, but we are under an, a, a threat or, or an interpretation of the threat that if we did that, that would be catastrophic. And so we don't know. And, um, you know, the, the, the polarized mediators play hard on one side or the other. How could you not do this? Um, the other complexity of the game, of course, is that the Republicans are going to push Biden into various actions. And if he takes them, they will condemn him for taking the actions they pushed him into. Classic, classic game they play. And, and everybody negotiating in the space is playing a variety of different games with their different audiences and their different constituencies and stakeholders and all that on top of their interpretations of their interests and whatever degree of knowledge they have about what's actually going on. Part of which is what do we know about what's in Putin's mind and the mind of the 10 people around him and the whatever number of dozens of people around them and what are they actually thinking and what are the dynamics among them? And Mike, you, you may know, I certainly don't know what, you know, to what degree we have any view into that at all. I assume we try, but who knows. Um. Grace, then Mike, then Ken, about we. Yeah, it's interesting. There's so many threads here, but I want to go back to the original thread of sense making because it's really interesting to watch how people are talking about different sources and challenging their mind. And really what happened for me, and this, this happened when the, during the first lockdown, and I just thought, I don't know anything. It was the first time I really had this experience. Like I cannot trust what anyone is saying in any media outlet anymore. Like nothing seemed to me at all trustworthy. And I thought, all right, well, what do I know? What do I know firsthand? And, you know, I'm close enough to, to Italy to know, okay, yeah, there's people dying in hospitals. I knew that in Milano. That was really clear. There are people dying in hospitals in Milan. And I, there were two ways that I was thinking about what do I know. One was where, where's the video footage, right? There was a lot of missing video footage of things that were being claimed. 
like I just didn't see videos of it. It was like, oh, there's this, this. And I'm like, wait a second, but there aren't any videos. Like, you know, people post when they're drinking a cup of tea on Instagram. If people are dying, why don't I see the videos? Why don't I see that? So that was one thing. And so, and I've kept that, <laughs> you know, like right now it's like, okay, who do I know who's Ukrainian? And do they speak a different language than Russian? Yeah, they do. And how do they feel specifically? Like the people who I actually know and what are they saying? And people, who, you know, people have met and touched, you know, like, and, and, and it's really interesting me to hear in this group that people are all talking about different perspective and nobody's talking about like, what's my lived experience? Because I've really defaulted to that. And it's been very interesting. And, you know, one of the things that has been, been, you know, very alternative experience, right? You're going to hear you said there's places, you know, I haven't gotten a vaccination because from the very beginning, I, my lived experience of that was a lot of people I knew were getting side effects from it. And very few people, you know, seem to really be getting long haul COVID. People are getting it. And I'm, you know, because death is, is not the real problem. It's very low death rate, but getting long haul COVID is the big, big problem. And I thought, well, it can reduce my percentage from 0.5% to 0.3%. And a lot of people I know are getting side effects. And it was just out of personal experience that I made that choice. And now some of the documents are coming out about how pervasive those side effects were and how much of that was, you know, um, you know, was happening. And so it's like, okay, wait, you know, but, and, and some of it also was my lived experience of the health professionals that I talked to. And I go to some alternative health professionals because conventional, conventional medicine has never done anything for my, I've had chronic sports injuries and things like that. And alternative health and stuff has, and they, you know, all those people are like, oh, don't touch that dangerous poison. And I'm like, okay, that's a little bit off. They're a little bit off their rockers with the dangerous thing, but, but still, you know, those were the people I trusted on my physical body because I had physical results in the physical world that made me trust those sources. And so it's very primitive. It felt really, it feels to me like I'm back to this very, very primitive state, like I, where if I don't see it with my own eyes, have, you know, five people who I know actually tell me it happened, then I, you know, I'm like, I don't know, you know, like the truck or convoy or something like that. I've got to see the video footage and I got to hear somebody who I really actually know who was firsthand there with the, with the convoy with, that was great. They had these like people who would just walk on the streets 24 hours a day and video was going on in, in, in Ottawa. I'm like, okay, I can believe that because a lot of the time the street is just empty. They really are there. And sometimes the street is full. And so there's this like drop down into like kind of the most primitive sense of like, only if I actually saw it, it happened. Um, which is, you know, kind of shocking in this age. Anyway, so that's what I've been thinking about sense making. That's kind of how I came around to this. Like, I realized I don't trust anything anymore. It's sort of like your your brain went tribal during these incidents of lots of things happening. It was like uh, I, I'm I'm going to believe my my senses and people I trust and and at some extent media. And there was a question in the chat about how do you know what videos to trust? And you you addressed that a bit, but but how do you like how do you wind up trusting a particular video source because they prove to be true over time, even though you'll never meet them probably or something like that? I mean, how do you extend the reach of what you believe? With the, yeah, with the video sources, it's multiple video sources and not any mainstream video sources. Like for me, it's like, okay, this is actually a person on the street or an actual trucker filming what he's seeing or an actual, and a lot of aggregating what a lot of what I would consider like actual people are seeing instead of like, because I'm only trusting what I do. Like I'm not trusting what some broadcaster is going to tell me. I'm only going to trust what individuals tell me kind of thing. And it's really interesting I mean, one of the things I think I might have said this in this group was this thing about the um, when I was in Berlin recently, the, the Jewish Museum is the only place they didn't uh, request a green pass. Surprise, surprise. And they had a display because I wouldn't I was like, I'm not showing a green pass like I was not willing to show. Agreed. I'm, I'm willing to get tested everywhere. I wouldn't visit my friends without getting tested. That's ridiculous. But I'm not going to show people my pass. And so I went to the Jewish Museum and there was a, a display with the passports, like with the, you know, the yellow star passports that you have to carry around. And in the display, it said half of the Jews got out of Berlin 
and half of them you know didn't right and i thought what were the other half thinking and then i thought oh oh that's what's going on now it's like half of us are going to make it because we'll have figured out whatever it is we need to figure out in the next pandemic or in the war with ukraine whatever like half the people make it and half the people don't because we're you know as as a general rule we don't know and some of us figure it out so yeah thanks grace um mike duncan thanks we are going in a lot of directions but i want to go back to a couple points that were made earlier and talk a little bit about what gil said about whether we actually know what putin is thinking um clearly very few people are even in the room and and it seems he's not sharing much with even them about what he really thinks. But it has been extraordinary how the US government and the intelligence community has been able to get insights into what Putin is planning to do. Um, all of this transparency about the interceptions that have been made and how we have their plans for disinformation and false flag operations, that's been extraordinarily successful. Uh, and and uh, if you haven't listened uh, to it, uh, CSIS did a session yesterday on C-SPAN with Leon Panetta and Bill Cohen, the, the former Republican Senator who became Clinton's defense secretary. And the two of them were talking about this new mode where rather than the spies carefully hiding what they know, we're now exposing as much as we can about what the Russians are up to. And this has completely undermined Putin's efforts to deceive people into believing that the Ukrainians are somehow at fault for the invasion. And there's some very scary stories coming out now that the Russians may do some kind of chemical attack and blame that on the Ukrainians. Uh, so stay tuned. But if you look at how the intelligence community does its job, they have these very intricate ways of kind of tracing data back to the source, making sure that their spies aren't being deceived by double agents. Uh, we, we really could benefit a lot if everybody was required to take a class in, in college on the basic elements of spy craft. Um, it also probably would be good if we learned how to write like spies, because they do have some very rigorous, well-structured ways of conveying information. Um, and I'll see if I can find uh, the one paper that I, I, I know of, which we used in, at Bloomberg uh, to train our analysts in how to suck in all this data, some of which is wrong, and then spit it out in a way that we can, we can justify and, and validate. Uh, but the last point on validation is that I learned on the Hill that it's also about um, what you know and who you know, who you know, who knows what. I have to drop off right now, but I will uh, I will come back on and I'll be watching the watching the um, watching the, the train. Thanks for being here, Mike. Appreciate it. Um, Gil, go ahead. You're muted. Okay, not you. You were waving at something else. Okay, good. Uh, Ken, if you want to go back to we, if not, uh, if you have another comment, if not, uh, yeah, just yeah. Um, we is a very troublesome word to me, and probably I think to many other people. Um, we need like we prime. We you know we need a range of we's. So when I hear people say we don't like to make you know choose among bad decisions and we're not set up to handle you know multiple you know messy problems i don't feel that i'm included in that we i actually like to tackle messy problems i'm one of the and i know other people who do so i'm part of a we that actually does like that so that's my only point is and i really i i have nothing to contribute to the conversation about putin's war on ukraine because it's so fucking complex i haven't figured out what kind of sense i can make out of it and so anything i say is just going to be an uninformed opinion so i'm keeping quiet until i have more information 
Um, but I, I am troubled by the by blanket statements like we, and I'm not picking on Gil in particular. It happens all of the time, and I'm guilty of it just as much as anybody else. And um, maybe maybe sometime we could do a call on what are the multiple levels of we, and how could we map them and put language to them that where we could start to make really fine distinctions about different we's. That would be an extremely useful sense-making effort, I think, for OGM. Yeah, and, I think. I think in fact, the, the landscape of a we around a particular topic is probably a really interesting thing, sort of a topographical perspective on who is included in we of what kinds of we right now, because I think that moves and shifts and varies. Sorry, Gil, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, um, I totally agree, Ken, and I was sloppy. I said we referring to an interpretation about generalized humanity. I should have labeled it as that. Because that's I mean, it's a useful way to speak if it's labeled. And I, it, what you're talking about drives me crazy because I see documents from people that use we in three different contexts within two paragraphs without distinguishing between what they are. Uh, and so it's maddening. And um, let's, yeah, uh, and yet another call for context in our language. Thank you. Thanks, Gail. So, what are useful frameworks for building shared context? Um, and maybe I'm posing this back to you, Grace, as a starter, which is I, I have a naive belief that shared building, shared construction of context and story is, is interesting and important and useful. Um, so how do we go about that? And maybe the way is we go fetch pieces of direct evidence and things that make sense to us and we contribute those into some pile in the middle uh, and then build from there. I don't know. But but. Um, and, and maybe this, there's a cor corollary question here, which is in, in your approach to gathering data on this, where does narrative or story or motivation or, or that level of thing step in and how do you process that? Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, we've really lost a lot of the context in which we can operate with shared narrative. And I mean, it helps me to be religious and to have a narrative around like, okay, what are appropriate behaviors in different, you know, different situations. I mean, one part of that particular narrative is we, we love to argue <laughs> to choose three opinions. Like that's part of the narrative. It's like that is a fun and entertaining thing to do is to disagree. Um, and that there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, that would be a great way to start is to not be like, oh, you don't think that diversity and inclusion is important? Okay, right, like <laughs> that, would, that would be fine. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't, you know, it's really hard. How do you build that from the ground up? How do you build culture from the ground up? And how do you have that shared narrative? I, that's for me a really big puzzle because religion has done a really good job of that, but you know, we don't have that basis and, and I don't, you know, I think that the United States was formed on a particular like culture and some values, but that kind of got lost. And I do think that it does go back to what George Washington said, which is like, you know, the, the purpose of education is to, is to teach people to be part of a democracy. And we even forgot what those values were. And when, when I, I sent my kids to public school and in Israel, because of the, the disagreements between the seculars and the religious, all of the secular schools teach almost nothing about Judaism. And my husband and I agreed that that was not okay with us. And we sent our kid to, it was a public school, but one that had a Jewish curriculum and a Bible curriculum as well, because we said, well, what the heck is a Jewish state about? Like, you're not going to have a Jewish state for very long if you don't have Jews in it. Anyway, lo and behold, um, that's all. Um, thanks, Grace. And before I go to Stacey, I just wanted to add, um, Scott posted, Scott Mooring isn't on this call, but he posted a really nice thing. I'm forgetting where I quoted it from or copied it from, but I'll paste it into the chat about just tell me more, um, which is the lovely way of inquiring within on people who might hold very different opinions. It's like, hey, I, I can see how your point of view might have shown up. I don't fully understand it. Tell me more. Help me understand your point of view. Help me, help me hear or see the way you see. Um, love that. Stacy. Yeah, and I was just going to say, Mike didn't get to go deeply in his opening statements about it, but he mentioned the emotional part of what happens within the tribe. And I was just going to say that um, people have 
it's not <laughs> questions are often taken as disagreements. Um, so in terms of how do we change that culture, I think that's an important piece. Um, so and I've, I feel like I've had pieces of this conversation several times in different contexts and different ways just in the last week about how we receive information. Like, like our ability to hear something without getting triggered is really important. How we respond to stimuli is really important. And, and some people who are spinmeisters are busy counting on their ability to spin us up uh, just, to do things. Go ahead, Stacey. I just wanna say, I think what's even more important is how we respond after somebody responds to our questioning. So the response to the response, or does yeah. that mean, does that just mean staying in the receptive state or? Yes. Okay. So, so hold, holding that place in some way. Um, uh, years ago, so uh, small side story, which is one, one of my favorite examples on this in a way. Um, one of my favorite books is The Great Transformation by Carl Polanyi, talking about the transformation into early industrial society and how it completely changed what was happening before. Then I read a six page letter by Murray Rothbard, who, um, and I'll, I've got a link to it in my brain, uh, who the six page letter was supposed to be kind of a review or critique of the great transformation, but it's a screed and it's a screed to his followers who are libertarians because Murray Rothbard was the head of the Mises Institute as in Ludwig von Mises. And he's basically telling libertarians, do not go read this book, it is terrible. And then he accuses Polanyi of a whole bunch of things that, that he himself actually commits in his six page letter. None of which Polanyi, from my perspective, is actually doing. It's really, really interesting. It's clearly a message to his followers. This is, don't, don't even go look at this. Don't, don't bother. It's not worth it. Um, and so I think this happens constantly. We're, we're, we're constantly directing others' attention toward or away from their felt experience, uh, whatever else. And, and you know, gaslighting, um, funny enough, is a contradiction of direct experience. Right? That's roughly what gaslighting is. Go ahead, Grace. Oh, sorry. No, you that just, was an you accident. Just, you just unmuted. I thought you were jumping yeah, in. Yeah, that was an accidental. I was trying to answer something in the chat and my wrist touched the wrong thing. That's funny. Um, uh, John, please. Okay. Um, I have four living siblings and um, I have a sister who is a priest. It's very unusual to have a woman priest in a in a Christian church, but she is one. And I have a brother and his and a sister-in-law who are pretty confirmed atheists. And I have a sister who is anti-vax. And I have another sister who is a nurse and suffering from cancer. And you know, it would be risky to visit her if you were anti-vax and had not been vaccinated. So what we got here is a kind of a, a pressure cooker of, uh, of disagreement. And we had a prior, we had a long, long history of uh, valuing what lasts, realizing, you know, we are the only ones that have the relationship that we have to each other in this life. That's it. We don't, we're not, we don't, we can't trade each other in. So we stuck with it and we're still sticking with it. We have a Zoom call every week, you know, and we go over stuff. So I, I, I wouldn't wish that on someone else, you know, unless they voluntarily decided to do it. It's a, it's a maybe an extreme form of, of what I'm suggesting, which is if you want to be a responsible sense making group, Yes, definitely. I, I definitely agree with the Grace's thing about go to go to primary source. You know, don't don't buy the media version. Go to can I can I get any direct quote from someone on the ground, someone video? Absolutely do that. But also kind of agree at the outset that we are going to mutually consume contradictory versions of what's going on. And so when we come to the table, we are going to have spoken or haven't have read and absorbed and, and we actually did this we actually had you know, we had to read the stuff that that the people who disagreed on the different sides of the vaccine and on the different sides of these other issues had put in and and um 
so that it just basically expanded our minds in terms of what we were able to navigate. And uh, we didn't so much, we didn't, I mean, we're still not, uh, <laughs> you know, I meet with my unvaxxed sister and we go to restaurants, we eat outside. She can't get in. Now she could, but I mean, you know, she couldn't get in because she wouldn't have a vax card. Um, we're still navigating this, but I, I would say that the, the process of agreeing up front that we are gonna we are gonna respect not just each other, but even models that are not from our siblings, but are from outside and that are contradictory and and troubling and you know, blah, blah, blah. And, 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 and our ability to absorb that um, enhances our ability to be who we are and to be available to each other. So that's it. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, Grace? Yeah, I really love that. I mean, that was one of the things I found most painful in my family was that there was no desire to understand why I was saying what I was saying. And there continues to be no desire to understand what I say, what I'm saying. And, you know, and, and I've never been infected and nobody wants to ask me why that is either. Like, what have you been doing? Everybody got it. You know, even us vaccinated people got it, and we're not asking you. Like, there's no no wish to understand, and I really, really admire your family, and I just want to say that's that's an amazing practice. And one of the interesting practices that I I had talked to somebody who was creating this decentralized uh, system for conversations, and that's exactly the way they constructed the way that you were talking about. Is like rather than saying I disagree with your opinion that they would post, I see the job's now off somewhere else, because I'm like suggesting the next thing that along to do with that. Um, but what people would do is they would say what it was about the article or the piece of evidence that they made, that made them feel uncomfortable. So that they weren't critiquing the other person's opinion, they were critiquing something about the article that the other person presented. And she and the person who did this research said that it was amazing to see that people were able to be open to other opinions when the critique wasn't about their opinion, but about the source article that they'd sent. So they'd say, you know, like, I read your article and it seems that that person was, you know, employed by so-and-so, or I read the article you sent me and that person seemed very emotional and that kind of turned me off. And so rather than critiquing the opinion, they'd be critiquing the pieces of article. And it turned out they were able to have better communication because the rule was you couldn't critique the person's opinion, only the article that they presented. And so it was really interesting because she was presenting that as like an alternative to Facebook or something like that, where it's like, I hate you. It's like, oh, well, this article that you presented seems to me from a suspicious source. Um. Your Grace, you're reminding me. There's lots of good things in the in the conversation here. You're reminding me that some facilitation formats intentionally uh, diffuse personal attacks. I mean, certainly uh, there, there's a bunch of of sort of things about polite discourse. But I was thinking about the writer's workshop format and. Uh, uh, Dick Gabriel wrote a nice book about how to run a writer's workshop, and in the writer's workshop, everybody contributes a work, everybody reads it, and then one at a time, the, the, writers who's, the writer whose work is being critiqued steps out of the circle, and everybody faces the middle of the circle where the work is sort of sitting, and they talk about what does the work, what does it sound like the work needs to be, what would make it more of what it appears to want to be, and, and, and critique of the author like, oh my god, what idiot wrote this piece is completely off the table for that format on purpose, on purpose, so that, so that people are willing to step in and do stuff. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, and, and at, at the risk of going on a, off on a tangent, I'm really interested in, I, I read some of Mearsheimer's pieces, Michael, do you want to jump in and just talk about, um, um, just frame, frame what he's saying for us? Uh, I don't know if I can really do it justice, but, um, but it's, it's really, um, I, th I think the interesting framing to back up to is, is the, U.S. in particular and the West in general behavior in the post-Soviet era of kind of unipolar power of um, wanting to precipitate through economics and in the case of the Middle East, at times military action, a sort of um, 
reverse domino effect of liberal democracies taking over the globe and everything's going to be fine um, and maybe taking a provocative step too far he, he points to the i think it was 2004 um, uh, agreement in budapest to make um to to say that ukraine would become a member of the european community would be able to join nato down the line and you know just really put russia on notice and you know in in other longer pieces than the one i linked to the talk in the new yorker you know he talks about the monroe doctrine and and the cuban missile crisis and you know just all the the real politic involved here that led to this situation. Whereas if Ukraine had been, you know, allowed to be Finland, we might have had a different story than, than we do now. And that, you know, it's easy to just turn everything black and white um, and say, Putin, evil madman, Ukraine, good guys. This is completely unprovoked, ridiculous, but it's more complicated than that. Thanks, Michael. Uh, it's you. Uh, I love that. Uh, the, the best sort of encapsulating sentence I heard about this thread yesterday, I think maybe the day before was, imagine if Mexico joined a security alliance with China. Like we'd be a little upset. We got a little upset over Cuba getting missiles, right? And and imagine, you know, Mexico, big country next door that we consider like practically part of the U.S. because we stole a third of their country anyway. Um, so so like that. Uh, anyone else want to elaborate on this part of it, Gil? Yeah, you know, just the irony of this is that the the best possible outcome that I could imagine. To this war, which is that you know Putin stands down, he gets Eastern Ukraine, Ukraine stays out of NATO, is exactly what Mearsheimer was proposing before the war, and what Kennan was proposing 30 years ago. Uh, and so, you know, um, I'm happy to blame Putin for being the thug, but I can also blame us for being stupid and greedy in the way that hegemons often are. Um, one of the problems here um, is polarity, polarization, binary choices, lack of complexity. And for example, my, under, my primitive understanding of the beginning of the Cold War is that John Foster Dulles and his brother uh, Alan Dulles, who ran the CIA and the State Department respectively, went around the world and told every country, you're either with us or you're against us. And forced countries like India. They were there were sort of countries that tried to become non-aligned nations and stay neutral if possible, but they were under enormous pressure to go one way or the other. Um, and in enforcing polarization, we then eliminate clever solutions like, hey, how do we create a safe buffer zone so that NATO can still be NATO, Russia can still try to be Russia, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I need to find a reference skill. I will uh, I'll try to figure out where I, where I got that from. Uh, and Mike or others who, who know more history than I do might, uh, might correct the story. Um, Mike, do you want to jump in? Okay. Um, but we, we, we sort of went, we went around the world and presented everybody an ultimatum. Uh, and, and by the way, being on our side means later agreeing to all these treaties and other sorts of things that roll cap, you know, consumer capitalism over your country that create overweening uh, intellectual property regimes that uh, the, so there's like, you know, the Western consensus or whatever, you know, phrase you want to use around this Washington consensus uh, is a thing and and uh, when you pick sides, it's funny, you, you drop into a vortex of activity that changes you forever. Uh, and, and good luck being sort of a sovereign nation that just can do its own thing. Yeah, you're sort of joining an, a we you don't wanna be part of in some way, but it's because you have a choice of two neighbors, neither of whom you particularly like or trust. And you're going to have to go to one of their parties. So how do we absorb this information? What, and, 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 then, and then on the other side, 
how do we make decisions about this that trickle upward into elections or actions that matter, that make a difference in countries? How does this turn into um, larger scale collective intelligence and decision making? Doug. Yeah, I'm wondering, uh, is, are, is this what's going on in the Ukraine and what's going on in much of the world? A reaction to uh, climate change and the deep feeling that things are really changing and shifting and what's happening is beginning to line up power as to how to deal with that. So I'm saying that there's a larger frame that we're all sort of aware of but not talking about that creates the conditions for the tactics that we're witnessing now. Um, Doug, thank you. And, and what's interesting is that there were, there were more than a handful of articles kind of after Biden's State of the Union in light of Putin's invasion of Ukraine saying, hey, the world has changed. Geopolitics are different. Uh, you know, Putin's current attack, even though Putin's aggressions on Ukraine go back 15 years, his, this, this sort of is a new moment. And those articles didn't, from the ones that I saw, weren't pointing to climate change and our ability to come together to try to do things collectively in a way that might actually sort of work to fix those those problems. And, and there is an opportunity to do so. There's, there's a moment where we might act together more wisely on the important issues in front of us instead of being distracted by all these other kinds of measures, which may in fact be what people would like us to be doing anyway. Um, Doug, did you wanna stay in that and go back to it? If not, then Grace. Uh, Grace. I feel like the answer to this question is the same answer as to Ken's question about why we all live in these organizations or in these collectives that don't um, serve us with governments that don't serve us. And I think th there's two answers, right? One is because we haven't built something else. Because there's a lot of talk about what doesn't work and there's very little, okay, let's move to something else and let's try something as a group and as a community. And when you do do something as a group and community, which is you know a lot of what I'm working on, you still end up dependent because you need some gas for your car. And you still end up dependent on this monetary system, which is really pervasive and I talk about a lot. And, but you, you know, and, and I actually think to some degree, rather than this global frame that Doug put on it, for me, there's a global frame uh, rather than the ecology, but that, I mean, we're in a completely unsustainable economic model that isn't working for people. And as Ken said, a very uh, unsustainable, what we're calling democracy, but governmental model and framework. And it's almost like as the systems are crumbling right in front of us, the systems themselves, and I'm just gonna, they've, they've kind of taken on their own itness and anybody who's tried to you know work in corporate you know change management and stuff like that like the, the corporation takes on its entity and it's like a big ship moving in this direction and it's like it's not that even that there's a person in it doing it it's it's just moving in its direction and so as these systems are crumbling they're kind of trying to not have us look at them and fix them and and trying to kill off anything that might fix them and including our attention you know, if we were calm and relaxed and not worrying that, you know, oh my gosh, there's another war and talking about the Ukraine, maybe we'd have time to be building something that's an alternative to something, you know? So even distracting our attention to these things is part of this big old mechanism that's just like, don't look over here, you know, don't look, I think one of us, I think Gil said like, don't look behind the curtain, don't look what's really happening in your government, don't look what's happening with central bank digital currencies, don't look what's happening with government control of, of the media, just, you know, Ukraine, look at that, look, 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 you know, so there's a little bit of that going on. Uh, Wendy. I really appreciate that addition, Grace, of, you know, there's not necessarily an alternative yet, right? And so that's the place that we're really stuck in. So it's easier to, it's very easy to, to distract us into something else because building something new is really, really hard. And I've been having a lot of conversations lately where we're talking about how, um, this gets a little philosophical, but my belief is that people, I think this is pretty well accepted, but people tend to make changes when they're scared of something or they're afraid of something or right, they're running away from something or they're in pain. And that's just human nature that we do that. 
Um, what I'm interested in seeing is the tipping point when people start making changes because something's better is calling them forward. And, and that is not, has not been our history. That's not usually when great change happens. Great change happens when pressure is put on the system, kind of forcing the system to change. So I'm, I'm, there's a part of me that's horrified by everything that I'm seeing. And there's a part of me that goes every single time. And I'm like, for the last 10 years, every crisis that comes along, I go, this is also fodder for the kind of change. And I think the evidence of, you know, the evidence is right in this group. We wouldn't be, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for COVID. I'm not sure this group would exist in this, or at least in the same way, if it weren't for COVID. A lot of when I get up in the morning and I think about my priorities, it's fueled by wanting to see change happen faster. If I was in a position where I was more relaxed and laid back, this would all in my own life be happening more slowly. And I think that's probably true for a lot of us. So I think I'm propelled forward and, and I try my best to also be propelled forward by what is calling me forward, what's emerging. And I think that's the crux, that's the shift. I, that's the joy to me in this group is that we're trying to listen for those things in the midst of being afraid and frustrated and angry and all those other things. We're trying our best to put those things aside so we can hear what really needs to come forward next, not just the next slight variation on a theme that's just going to make us feel better for five minutes. Um, Wendy, I love that. And also as inspiration. So why don't we just go, go quiet for just a moment uh, so we can process what's been said so far. And I'll bring us back out. Thank you. And, and you made me think of something that I'm just putting in the chat, which is um, as we redesign our futures together to do kind of what this conversation is about, which is to be really open in that process, because it's really easy to design a future that stays in the ruts that we've been raised in, the ruts we've been taught, our ruts or the, 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 the constraints and all that. And many of those constraints are artificial, are, are not actually real. So and navigating change at that scale is really hard, but but doable. Um, Doug, then Mike. I think part of what holds us back is our understanding that the better future that we're talking about and would like, one that's actually quite different from where we are, would require the death of a lot of people. We have too many people on earth to sustain a simpler system, which we need. So we're stuck. So um, overpopulation is one of these things I know almost nothing about and have strange ideas about and wonder what other people think about and would love to know more about um, in the sense of, it, uh, and one of the major arguments for sustainability is look, it's gonna, it, we need seven earths to actually uh, carry you know, uh, the people who are on, it, on the planet right now, et cetera, et cetera. And it feels to me like, with a couple of changes in habits, we can, in fact, actually feed everybody. And it also seems like most countries, except for uh, Latin America and Africa, are depopulating. The major growth of the next couple of decades appears to be like Africa is going to double from 1 billion to 2. Uh, that's at least the, what the trends show. And, and Europe is like Europe, Japan, a whole bunch of places are just depopulating. And they're not that interested in, in immigrants, although Poland just absorbed a, mi a million plus Ukrainians, uh, hopefully temporarily. But, but I think that our narratives around overpopulation, and remember the book, The Population Bomb, way back when? Uh, that made a lot of people sort of uh, jump up and do stuff, but I think uh, was proven wrong over time. So uh, these are the kinds of things that, that form background narratives for why we make decisions and what we do. And, and this, this, we need seven Earths to feed everybody thing. I refuse to sort of buy that. I think that we can actually feed everybody, we just feed them differently than we do now. Uh, Mike, Julie, and then Gil. I wanted to 
pull back to what, what for me was the best quote of the discussion. And that was, you can't handle the truth. There's just too much of it. Did, while I was missing in action, did you talk much about information overload and- you know, oh, We totally, to we totally solved goods? that problem. Well, I, please tell actually, me. Actually, no, we didn't, we didn't address it at all. But, uh, well, if someone has seen a good article and that's written in the last 10 years, when we've seen a factor of 100 in, increase in how much information we're exposed to, I mean, I'd like to see it. I, I read a lot of the stuff that was written 30 years ago when we all felt that there was more information than we could profitably use. But what, what, what are people thinking? I mean, what is, what is the answer when there's twice as much information at our fingertips and i i for one i'm i'm very anxious about the fact is it's not just fear of missing out experiences and fun times it's fear of missing out something that's really going to help me understand the world i'm living in i just want to cut in with one comment and that is the idea that we have more information it might be true in terms of bits but it's not true in terms of concepts and understanding uh, we could say that we've actually got a lot less now than we had 20 years ago. Well, we have a lot um, more data. I would argue we also have a lot more information. We don't have more knowledge and we certainly don't have more wisdom. Or it's harder to find it. It's harder to find it. But I, I think the information's out there. There's a lot more people who have a megaphone and who can take the data and combine other people's information and spit out another article. In, in my field of international relations and technology, there's just stuff being produced at an amazingly fast rate because people are writing something every week. They used to work very hard and write something every six months. Uh, yes, um, I forgot what I was going to throw in the conversation. Julian. You were going to tell me the answer, Jerry. I think it had something to do with Jerry's brain. I think that was the answer. Well, I mean, part, part of your question is... Uh, central to OGM's quest, which is like, okay, great. How do we make sense of this? How do we not drown in the info torrent, right? And, and my naive answer is, hey, we take it, we grab the bits that make sense and we put them in the middle together to piece together some view of what's happening and what we think it means and why, we, why it came from. And then we can hold that up against someone else's argument for what happened and where, or where it came from. And then maybe together we can have a better conversation and less of an argument about what to do together. And lather, rinse, repeat on that at all scales uh, with decentralization down to the fingertips because usually the people closest to an issue are the ones who know the most about the issue, um, which is really hard when you're talking about nuclear non-proliferation or, or you know, nation scale crap like that. But synthesis doesn't always come from the edge. I mean, synthesis often comes from talking to 50 people who are at the edge and you know, are, are on the ground doing stuff. Yep. But what I'm I what I was going to say is the principles that are needed to guide policy and business decisions. I'm missing the basic understanding of some of the trends that we're up against. I, we just mentioned population. That's a great example of where the whole frame was wrong for 30 years. Right. And, and we've had several frames we've lived with for a long time. And I just remember the thing I wanted to, to sort of add to what you had said, which is a, a thing I'm skeptical about is that we're, the world is just getting more and more complex. I'm like, you know, staying alive back in the day of Marsh Arabs uh, in Mesopotamia was really complicated. And they understood things about nature and plants and interactions that would boggle us. And we would die in a week if we you know, didn't master or absorb some of what, what they understood. It's like things have been complex forever. We now have the ability to record them on things that are faster than clay tablets and uh, you know, in, in vastly more volume. And then there's the whole knowledge pyramid thing, which I'm not that fond of either, but, but it's, a, it, it's, it's complicated. Well, Jerry, we can have a beer and argue about that. I think, I think the globe is definitely more complex because we're not just seeing our little piece of real estate. We're able to understand things going on around the world. I would say though, I'd, I'd rather be Mike Nelson in Arlington, Virginia than a Marsh Arab living on the edge of survival I'm and totally as you say, it's a very that. complex little world that they were in, but the consequences actually, of not getting a piece of data was pretty severe. So actually, the reason I brought up Marsh Arabs is that I love the book Against the Grain, in which he argues that the skeletal remains of Marsh Arabs were much healthier than the civilized folk who were raising wheat and grain in the cities, and that civilization was actually a step backward. 
so 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 the thing you just said about living on the edge of precarity or on the edge of survival not so true people who understood how to live on the landscape were doing just fine thank you very much and we're spending if you read marsh uh, salins on stone age economics or whatever they're spending 15 hours a week making food collecting food whatever and the rest of the time they were passing heritage telling stories going on i don't know going on raiding raiding trips in, to go and kill people in the neighbor, neighboring tribe i mean that was the other cases, thing in some cases doing that in other cases not in other cases going on raiding parties to find a bride because in some cultures you marry inside the tribe in other cultures you can't marry inside the tribe you must go to the next village to marry and that's a cultural thing that gets passed down it's like these are super interesting things that that dictate how how life plays out um julian thank you for your patience uh, so the thing is that when I raised my hand, we were on a different subject Exactly. <laughs> about uh, feeding the world's population. I was going to point out that it's not a matter of feeding, it's a matter of sustaining the population. And the framing of that has been responsible for a lot of the approaches to trying to deal with it. So I like that Mike brought up this issue of framing a problem because that's, you know, the, the problem itself is frequently the framing of the problem. So um, I just want to throw in the comment about that and then get back to what Mike brought up. Love that. Uh, Wendy? Yeah, so Mike, in, in response, you brought up a lot of thoughts for me about um, where the overwhelm is coming from. And I think, um, so I pushed in the chat the, the movie Social Dilemma, which talks about this yeah. a little bit. Um, but also, I, there was a time in which I came across a bunch of articles around phantom work. And what I mean by that, if, because um, I don't think it's like a, a very popular term, is that you know the the idea that companies looking for short term profit have offloaded work onto the average person, whether it's you do more you know more people do their own taxes or bag their own groceries or you know fill out forms that are um, you know increasingly more complex and and crazy or sign into you know a million different portals to give their information a million times over you know it's it's not that each one in and of itself seems out of context or seems wrong it's that in total the amount of time we each spend duplicating the work that used to be done by say one local administrator or one local person that would come that come and help you out all that's been kind of stripped out for lots of reasons and has fallen on the shoulders of the average person at different rates you know and i think that falls harder on people who maybe are marginalized or or um, on the fringes of society or just our caretakers or things like that as examples and i'm over generalizing but i'm saying in terms of overwhelm there's more than just the data overwhelm there's also task oriented overwhelm um, and just being bombarded by simple things of life just somehow taking more um pro, pro, you know products breaking more often is another example of just having to research and buy another product like all these things combined each one is fine all these things combined take up a tremendous amount of resources energy time from the system that could be put towards other things so for for me that's a that's a big one as a as a mom <laughs> I just have to. That was very obvious to, to me. I have to interrupt and say yes, 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 and share my pain. <laughs> I, I, I got my eyes examined, got a new prescription. Warby Parker has now sent me three pairs of glasses, none of which have the right prescription. One of which had the the the, the, the this piece, the temple, was completely warped. And then yesterday, I got my new phone, and went to the T-Mobile to transfer. The data from this phone to this phone, 30 gigabytes of my favorite photo are somewhere in between these two phones. Oh. Probably because Carnegie has all these software for security, but the, the photos are not on either phone. And uh, they're not replicated to some kind of cloud store? It doesn't pair. Uh, what, right. if you, the, what if you dropped your phone in, in the ocean? <laughs> I, I, have, I have some of it backed up. Okay. Uh, it's it's one of those, right? It's and now this is a project that takes a tremendous amount of you that of course you want to pursue that takes an, a tremendous amount of your time because the quality of the work being done is not great. And now it's your I, now I, it's your problem. I, I think it's intentional. I think they detected the fact that I didn't back up all my data to the cloud. And they went, ha, 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 ha. they were gonna show me. <laughs> That's right. Some of it's That's backed right. up to the Carnegie Cloud, but anyway. 
Thanks. Um, Ken? Thanks, Wendy. The, you just triggered something. Pete and I have been having a little uh, conversation in the chat about hyperscale or, uh, systems, and and I'm viewing them as parasitic, not symbiotic, and therefore detrimental to life. And Pete, I can't track and listen to all this and think at all. But when you started to talk about, you know, how um, everything is made to break these days, and you know, you walk. I had the flu about five or six years ago and I was really in a bad way and I got up at two in the morning and went to the 24-hour pharmacy looking for something and I'm standing there with a temperature of 103 degrees at this wall of choices and I'm like just give me the fucking something that's going to stop my coughing you know and and we, we've reached this point where everything is designed to maximize uh choice and to maximize profit and to and in 16 Things to Know About Life, uh, Hoagland talks, he's a biologist, he talks about maximization is, is um, uh, addiction. Nature does not maximize, nature optimizes. And I think we, we live inside, and here I'm using we again, um, but our economic system, and Jerry, we can talk, about, I'll send you the, the paper, 16 Things to Know About Life. The example he gives is, is um, antlers. So you could increase... Um, the amount of calcium in antlers, but it might and it might make them stronger, but it might also make them too heavy for the, the animal to lift its head. So it's finding the optimal balance um, of getting things together. And I just feel like we're we're in this world right now that seems incredibly out of control. Um, I'm a big fan of the right to repair movement, which I think is is incredibly important, where people just don't have any sense of. We can take this and make a product, and if it breaks, it doesn't matter. We'll, you know, it's that's going to drive up demand with no thought of the downstream consequences. I, I think that kind of sums up for me uh, part of the um, uh, the challenge we're facing is we it, it feels like the number of of the amount of attention that's paid to downstream consequences is incredibly small and needs to grow exponentially large in every system for us to start to think about what are the the impacts of this um, when we're not here or tomorrow or whatever. So I, I'm not necessarily being coherent. It's just a whole bunch of, of the, a cascade of thoughts got triggered when you were when you were saying that, Wendy, that seems really related to this conversation that Pete and I are having about hyperscale systems and you know how the world works. So uh, that's all I can that's all I can say right now. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. And we are moving quickly, and it is a, a bit of an overload. It's sort of an exciting conversation. Um, I wanted to throw in also the illusion of choice, <clears throat> in that very often, if you walk down the cereal aisle or the personal products aisle, it's really only two companies that are offering you all those different brands. And what they're trying to do is, is like fill the shelves and product differentiation and product variation. If you go look at Kit Kats or uh, you know, it, sometimes it's surprising, like Reese's has figured out, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Every holiday, we're gonna have a Reese's variant and we're gonna do like 15 different kinds of Reese's this, Reese's that, and it fills the shelves and more space means more purchases, I guess, but it creates this nightmare uh, uh, behind the scenes. Mr. Carranza. A long time ago, I read a book that basically said, with all the things that have been designed in the world, the detergents getting into the groundwater and um, cars, the, the best things that humans could do was stop designing. Um, and I thought that was hilarious. And I started an institution of one, the Institute for the Prevention of Design. And I continued to think about that for many decades, since that was in 1984. And there's an aesthetic of prevention. There's something about prevention that can be beautiful, that can be attractive. Um, and it doesn't have to be warfare. Um, I remember my mother, who was one of the most unhealthy people I know, subscribing to a magazine named Prevention. And, uh, you know, ounce of prevention worth a pound of cure. Um, and it's a different way of thinking. And I don't still know, you know, if it's only narrative. Narrative seems to me kind of a 
over-focus and over-coherence on a particular kind of thinking. And there are so many other ways of processing information. I'd like to close with a, a quote I remembered from Marshall McLuhan. What for others is information overload for the artist is pattern recognition. Thanks. And also for masters of whatever trade is recognizing chunks. Same sort, same sort of, same set of ideas. Uh, Michael. Yeah, um, it's it. Mark neatly cir circled back around to something that was uh, coming up for me before um, Doug had had pushed back on the idea that um, that you know there was really more information, and what there is, I think pretty unarguably is more information availability. Um, and well, <laughs> I, I, I smile at the, the um, at Mark's opposition to design. Um, I think design as, as a designer for most of my life, um, I always bristled at the idea that design was seen as um, the frosting on top of, you know, I, I worked in publication design primarily, and it was like, okay, everybody do their thing, hand it to the designers, they'll make it pretty and accessible to the outside. And that is a lot of people's, you know, conception of design in a lot of cases. But when you think about architecture or you know systems design of many kinds it's more essential and more to design something is to like do do something much like the the antler question where you're you've you're taking all the givens you're balancing the needs and coming up with a solution um, that that is appropriate and we don't have the solution we haven't designed the solution that's appropriate to the amount of information that is currently accessible and you know which which would be the ability to filter by relevance to our need based on um, the actions that other people have taken where it sits in jerry's brain you know where it is you know what the the new source of something is all, all those factors that could be technically assigned by us to get us exactly the information we need at the time that we need it um, with some kind of collaborative weighing of its, of its quality or relevance. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, that's the design mission in, in my book. Um, and I also wanted to, uh, sorry, let me, let me pull this back. Um, uh, I lost a piece of what I was, what I was going to say, but that if, if it comes back to me, I might put my hand up again. No worries. It'll drop back into your mind as soon as you've like stopped trying to look for it. Um, thank you. That was a lot of stuff. Um, where does that, what is that, any, let, let's, we've got 10 minutes left on our call. Um, let's go back to the question a little bit and say, what does this mean about how we process news or information? Please, Michael, you remembered it. I did, and it's relevant to your question. Sweet. Um, so, the 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 problem with you know facing that information overload, and um, and wanting to filter better, and wanting to like say what things are relevant that you know people who I know have vetted or would bring to my attention or would say, take this with a grain of salt or, you know, like what we're all doing here, what I was doing when I brought up Mearsheimer, you know, take this with a grain of salt, da, 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 it's worth, you know, putting in the filter. Um, we are being, 
in, in our news intake, we are being counter-programmed by the economic force that is the attention economy. Because, you know, as we're looking at a, a too wide, too, um, a, you know, a big availability of information, the stuff that's shouting loudest at us is the stuff that we're, that's candy. That's the most tempting to us. And in the case of the news processing public, it's simple story, you know, outrage, um, you know, good guys, bad guys, madman, nuclear threat, you know, the, the simplest terms on something like um, the current conflict in, in the Ukraine. And that, that, that is happening with every story there is, is that advertising support for attention driven media and that being our access to information works in almost diametrically opposed the way to, to the way that we would want to be able to surface quality weak signals with the benefit of of the people around us so i'm just i'm muted sorry um thanks michael there's a lot here about how we design the instruments or systems for propagating what we hear and see. Uh, John had his hand up briefly before Julian, Doug, and Mike went up. So John, then Julian, Doug, and Mike. Thank you. Um, so yes, we're at this point that we are frequently at where we've had a really rich, complicated conversation. And uh, some of us are struggling to make sure we capture the, uh, the chat uh, because we know we didn't have an opportunity to think carefully enough about what we heard as it was happening, and we want to reflect on it. Um, an idea just came to me, you know, like, would, could we co-author a Google Doc of some limited number, you know, 25 guidelines for, uh, for sense making uh, from Open Global Mind? You know, and we, we could we could collectively author it and and uh, edit it, and it may it may gel, and it might be twenty five. I don't know that it's twenty five. I just made mm -hmm. up, you know. But like basically, let's. I'd be willing to contribute to something to see if we can get it to come together. And um, actually, if we if we find that we have relatively opposite principles that some of us want to promote and others of us you know want to promote the opposite, that's an interesting challenge to have a format that would allow you to say here's a here's a point of here's a tech here's a technique and here's the rationale for the technique and here's a here's an argument against the technique or the opposite technique and here's the argument for that uh, opposite technique all aimed at the goal of sense making so i'm i'm willing to put some time into contributing to that google doc if anybody else is up for that yeah I see Mike's hand. That's great. Um, uh, I like I like the idea a lot. Uh, my path toward that over time has been to try to do pattern languages. So there might be a pattern language for sense making, and we've had a couple of efforts that haven't panned out to create a platform where we can actually start to maybe create our own pattern language, but then also. And this is maybe just my goal, but fold in the pedagogy pattern language, the liberating structures pattern language, the wise democracy pattern language. There are a bunch of neighboring uh, groups, collections of wisdom, of distilled wisdom that, that feel to me like a piece of the sense making thing at different levels and layers. And, and figuring out how to steer our way through that would be really exciting to me. Um, so I, and, and to me, that's not a Google doc with 25 things, but it turns into multiple posts and multiple things that some of us like, like, oh, my favorite are these or something like that. I, I don't know if that makes, if that worries sense. you or uh, makes, makes You sense. know, and I was one of the earliest contributors to the, uh, the group process pattern language, um, back starting back in 2008. And I, I saw how long that took, what is the scale of that project, which Frankly, I got a little depressed uh, <laughs> after working on it some and then seeing how long it was taking. So, uh, and yet the final product is, I'm really glad the final product is there and it's worth it and it's good. Right. Uh, maybe, I don't know, if, if, if I, I see that the Google Doc as a, as a step towards that 
that pattern. So the, the path to pattern languages is likely paved with many a Google Doc. Yes. And so I think I think a pragmatic, quick um, way to start it would be to do exactly what you said, John. And okay. if, if you wanted to start a Google Doc, drop it into the most appropriate channel on Mattermost, and then uh, help you know see who else wants to show up for that conversation. Let us know on the on the uh, OGM Google group. Uh, I think we can sort of go through that. That'd be great. I I will uh, agree to start it. I might need a slight bit of advice from you or Pete about how to exactly inject it into the right uh, Mattermost channel. Please uh, to ask yeah, at the front desk. Just raise the white courtesy telephone and someone will answer. Oh, okay. <laughs> do um, I have to have a mask on when I do that? No, oh, okay. No, no, no. The white courtesy telephone is indifferent. <laughs> okay. And very objective as last last I heard. That's great. That's great. Okay. Um, we're nearing the end of our conversation. So let's go. Um, Julian, do you have your hand up from before? Or is um, I've forgotten. Oh, uh, it's still up. Okay, good. So let's go Julian, Doug, Mike, Stacey, and then Ken has a poem for us to take us out. And I wanted to directly answer your question about what do you do with information overload? <clears throat> oh, good. Dandelions, I think that's a very appropriate answer. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Carmichael. I'm thinking that the word information is part of the problem. It gives the illusion that we know what we're talking about. And in particular, there's the hint that talking about information is relatively rational because information probably can be quantified, which is totally false. Simple example, take uh, all the characters in Hamlet. And that's one thing. Now we're going to take another thing, which is a string of random characters as long as Hamlet. In information theory, there's more information in the second than in the first, because Hamlet has so much redundancy, which reduces the information, which is totally counterintuitive, but it's implied by the idea of information. So maybe a future session, we could talk about what is information. Done. Thank you, Doug. I like that. Um, Mike. Uh, just another piece of homework uh, and a suggested topic. Uh, I had the weird experience of watching The Five, which is a Fox News program, just as the U Ukraine invasion was starting. I would challenge everybody to watch 20 or 30 minutes of this and come to understand what's happening here. I mean, this is with Geraldo Rivera and three or four other people. I'll watch anything Geraldo does, for God's sake. <laughs> it, is a, it, it is a farce. It's farce news. We have, we have Fox News, which actually reports some news just straight off the wire service. And then they tell you what to think about it. And then they have farce news. And it's like Stephen Colbert, except they lie. Except it's real, like Colbert. And then they a, point a, out their lies. Yeah, the Colbert so report after thirty minutes of this, it. after thirty minutes of this, you are just totally discombobulated, and this is why so many people, not only in the U.S., have just said, "I don't know what's going on," but give it a try, and maybe we should have a talk about you know the confusion as a business model. Um, and Pete, is that? Uh, are you able to locate the clip of the show that Mike was just referring to? Uh, not, not sure. Okay. It's on well, every day, I think. No, it's, no, uh, uh, Pete, Mike, I'm, I'm referring to exactly that moment when the invasion started, what, the show that you were watching at that moment. I would love to just have a reference to that. I um, did put a YouTube search, uh, The yeah, Five Ukraine, which exactly. Thank you. is the start. Cool. Uh, Doug, then Stacy, and then Ken. I should have taken my hand out, sorry. Oh, no worries, Stacy. then Ken. Yeah. I, I don't know how you did a half hour of that. I do five minutes and I'm, I'm shaking. Um, yeah, I'm just really disheartened because a minute, uh, about three minutes ago, I got um, a Facebook message from, I, I think I've mentioned that I've been having an ongoing conversation with a friend who lives in America, but she's originally from Russia, friend slash acquaintance. And I had sent her that video of the three captured Russian soldier, 
And I sent it to her and I said, can you verify that they're translating this properly? Because I figured that's like a, you know, a good way to show I'm open. And, and she just sent me back like that. She thinks it's totally fake. And they don't even, they look Ukrainian, not Russian. And where do I go with that? So I just had to vent. <laughs> Thanks, Stacey. And one of the things that's, that's weird and interesting and happening is that these are heavily documented wars. Like everybody's carrying a high definition video camera and their communications gear uh, that, you know, a hundred years ago was unavailable, that 50 years ago is the reason CNN exists as a news entity because, you know, uh, they were able to drop camera gear like that anywhere in the world uh, faster than any other uh, news agency and use satellites to communicate back in, et cetera, et cetera. And now we're all carrying it. And it seems like the backstory, like someone behind the stage there recorded video and post, like, like there has to be a web. Um, uh, Microsoft had a thing called Photosynth, probably still has it. Oh, where they just they just comb through tourist photographs of let's say the the Pikes Peak or the Pikes Fish Market uh, in Seattle, and they can assemble everybody's photographs of, of the same place, and then they can situate them in space and time, so that you can then cruise through what the fish market looked like at different moments in time from different perspectives. It's really, really, really interesting, done from casual photographs that, that, that there happen to be too many of in the world, right? And so, so where do those things meet? And where do those things meet credibility and digital notarization and whatever else so that we can start to trust that those image weren't, images weren't manipulated? Because at the same moment, we get TensorFlow and GAN networks and uh, all kinds of crazy things that allow us to manipulate said images and then create faithful recreations of people saying things they never said, et cetera, et cetera. And we're right at that cusp as well. And those two things are happening simultaneously. And I don't know what to trust. Um, Gil, you have a last word before a poem from Kat. Stuart Brand had a cover story in Coevolution Quarterly, must have been back in the 80s, about the, up, the, the up, upcoming utter undependability of visual records. And he was, you know, presaging face, fake photography, fake video, fake news, and so forth. It's, uh, it was very, it was a very early flag of that. Um, back during the Tiananmen Square uh, event, some of my pals took it upon themselves to focus on delivering handheld camcorders into China as their most significant action they could take. Um, um, gee, what was, what the main thought was, oh yeah, there was, a, there was a, a news report last night, I think it was on MSNBC of a restaurateur in uh, Ukraine who had sent his wife and two children out of the country and stayed there to fight and was puzzled that he hadn't heard from his father who lives in Russia for days, days into the war had not heard from his father. So he called his father to tell him what was going on. His father said, well, that's not true. There's no war going on. He said, I'm here. There are bombs falling around. His father said, that's not true. And uh, it was remarkable mm -hmm. to hear, you know, to see the effectiveness of the Russian propaganda, that this is a man whose grandchildren are at risk mm -hmm. and had fled the country and he couldn't hear it. Thanks, Gil. Speaking of information. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Mr. Homer. So <clears throat> I, I was trying to think of what's an appropriate poem for sense making. And um, one of the people that I found makes amazing sense of, of the world is Emily Dickinson. So there's a little poem by her. The brain, not Jerry's, the brain is wider than the sky. If we put them side by side, the one the other will contain with ease and you beside. The brain is deeper than the sea. For hold them blue to blue, the one the other will absorb as sponges, buckets do. The brain is just the weight of God, for half them, pound for pound, and they will differ, if they do, as syllable from sound. Can you read that one more time, please? Sure. The brain is wider than the sky. For put them side by side, the one the other will contain, with ease and you beside. 
the brain is deeper than the sea. For hold them blue to blue, the one the other will absorb as sponges, buckets do. The brain is just the weight of God for half them pound for pound, and they will differ if they do as syllable from sound. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. That was a lovely, lovely call. Um, one thing in case everybody's scrambling to take notes and follow the chat, I always upload these calls to YouTube and then I put the link to that and the chat and the transcript because now uh, Zoom enables auto transcripts for free and Pete remembers to turn that on when I don't, which is often. Um, all of those things are available on the Mattermost and uh, online in different ways. So uh, don't worry about the, the bulk things. And then brief side note, Pete and I and Wendy Elford had a delightful conversation a couple of days ago about scaffolding and so what things are necessary for us to make sense? What artifacts do we leave behind? And then that's just a thin sliver of the scaffolding conversation, which I could barely explain. But uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot there, and it was really rich. Thanks, everybody. And wow. Jerry, there's a recording of that conversation, maybe? I, uh, Pete? I think there is. I'm not, I'm not sure it's a, a, a share thing. I think it might be an internal thing that, that gets digested and shared yeah, in, in no problem. complete form. OK. Sometimes there are, sometimes there aren't. Thanks. Exactly. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye-bye. Ciao. Oh.